and one of the couple of things the stock will focus on one is um, i will be referencing two stories from my repertoire during the stock uh, one is a folk tale based from india and another is a myth from egypt both which i have worked with and there have been some learnings in the process of working with these uh, two uh, stories um the the elements i want to emphasize in my talk are um i suppose um the idea of um going inwards in in my story process in order to extend and communicate the story outwards to people from different backgrounds and different cultures um so in other words what i'm trying to talk about in my story preparation work is how does one work with coming towards story or recovering story rather than an intentionality or an aim that i as a storyteller want to communicate through a story so in other words i'm i'm looking at uh, the story as a process of recovering memory recovering collective memory and asking the question of my body what story does my body want to tell in other words i'm not kind of thinking of what are my memories that i want to communicate as you know dennis kind of talked about being migrant i'm a migrant i came to the uk when i was 26 years old um so i had a had a whole life in india and instead of working with the idea of what are my memories and my roots that i want to kind of bring out um i uh, kind of start with the basic question asking of my body of myself what story do you want to tell so the intention is sort of backgrounded so in other words um let me tell you a story about this process so the first indian story i told in public was actually born out of laziness i was at a storytelling workshop and had a good lunch and i was given 2 hours to prepare and tell a new story now i can't say whether it was the effects of that lunch or just the warmth of the english afternoon but i was feeling completely lazy and my laziness led me to the library and to a section of stories on women the same laziness led me to stretch out my arm and pick a compilation of stories from around the world where women were the central protagonists now i picked this collection of stories of women not because of any ideological fervor i i wasn't in i was too lazy to get into that domain uh but i picked that collection because well i identified myself as a woman and so gave myself the entitlement to tell the story of a woman it wasn't the most auspicious of beginnings the story i told that afternoon was can you hear me um yeah okay so the story i told that afternoon was nothing like the story of the on the page of the book that i had picked up it surprised even me where did the images in my story come from perhaps the only link might have been that the book stated the story came from central maharashtra which is the region of my father's ancestry now i have never visited this place nor had my father after his childhood and nobody in the family knew if the village still existed or had been swallowed up by mumbai and pune great big urban conglomerations there were no images of our ancestral region which was spoken about in family chats the story that i told resonated in my body as i told it in other words i hadn't prepared the images i'd read the story and decided right i can tell the story it's easy where i felt it was easy i did not know it was a story that grew 
that shape shifted and that fell back into the story that I told for the very first time. It was something like a song, a raga in Indian classical music, that there is a base skeleton that is then fleshed out and it changes form with every telling. And it continues to do that, a short two-page story. Few stories I had told until that time had such arrivals, such growings, and such departures while staying the same story all the same time. Of course, I was really pleased and ego, ego boosted. I was like, ah, I'm a great storyteller. Well, four years later, I started a journey of finding out more about my family. Most of those from my father's generations, his siblings, my, his cousins, my aunts, uncles, they had all died. I just had my youngest aunt, who was 85 years old, to speak about any memories she might have had about her parents' village. She had been four or five years old when they visited the ancestral place for the last time. And she remembered very little. She said, I was just four years old. How will I remember anything? Now, personal memories, as you and I know, they are a very specific reservoir. So I began to inquire about the larger pool of collective memories of the family, stories that were told in the village as she was growing up. So I asked her about her memories. She said, I don't know. And I said, well, what about like, you know, stories you grew up with? Were there any stories in the village that were told? She did remember a story. Something told as a story to her as a child. It was an anecdote that had happened to her great uncle and great aunt. That means two generations removed from me. My great grand uncle and aunt. And was perhaps, yeah. So as she began to tell that story, and she was telling it in Marathi, the local language, the contours of a very familiar story arc emerged. And magnificently, so did the details of the landscape of that story. And it was chillingly close to the first time I had told that story in the UK without knowing anything of this. So the very phrases that I had used to describe the landscape in which the story was set, she began the story with those phrases. I suddenly realized that it was a family story that had entered collective memory and then no doubt egged on by the medium of a colonial pen, had found itself into an anthology of English language stories of women. My journey with this story raised some very interesting questions regarding my relationship with this story. It is well known that fragments of ancestral memory travel down generations. Now, while there is enough and more literature um, and studies available on the transmission of traumatic memories, especially around you know, the Holocaust and how traumatic memories transfer down generations through the body without having mentioned them in the family, there's not much material available on the movement of other memories over generations. Over the many years of storytelling, I've begun to sense a difference between a story told because it fascinates the teller and a story that springs out of the depths of their being. When a story springs out of the depths of their being, their body, their memory, it often takes even the teller by surprise. How did they know how to say that particular detail? Why does a particular story obsess or haunt a teller even when they may not like it? Fascination of the story is only a tip of the memory. At times, to kind of push it feels too willful, as if breaking into a horse to ride it. And for me, telling a story because you're just fascinated by it is a bit like, you know, breaking a horse in order to ride it instead of riding a wild horse. I'm not sure how much it allows the teller to move with the story, rather than making the story do the teller's bidding. Through the above example, I look at the full circle that a story may make through personal 
and more historical elements, wherein a personal story enters into collective memory to return to the family lineage down the generational line. There is a circularity. Um, so that's one point I was going to make. And here I kind of talk about, so this story that I told, the folktale from my father's ancestral region was about decoits, about um, bandits. Now this story arc about outwitting bandits by a protagonist is not new. For those who live in, in areas infested by bandits, they know it's a constant and everyday part of life. Walter Benjamin, he speaks about the storyteller as someone who relies on a bedrock of ability to share experiences rather than pass information. In other words, a story is grounded not just in sharing one experience of outwitting bandits, like the one I told, but maybe it's a conglomeration of many such moments and many such memories. Whether it is multiple incidents that constellate into a story and then passes over many tongues through generations, or it is a seminal one incident that creates a template for a story to pass over generations is a matter of speculation. That is what storyfying, story work is about. Walter Benjamin also says something really prescient about the assimilation and remembering of stories by individuals and collectives. He says, and I quote, this process of assimilation of story, which takes place deep inside us, requires a state of relaxation. If sleep is the height of physical relaxation, then boredom is the height of that mental relaxation. Boredom is the dream bird that broods the egg of experience. The more self-forgetful the listener, the deeper what is heard is inscribed in him. In other words, a world that is conditioned to preparing or rehearsing, this idea of boredom may seem counterintuitive, but there is some truth that Benjamin touched upon it is often when one is not looking for a story that a story arrives and lodges itself in one's remembering. This state of boredom becomes a ground for remembering and a kind of recognition that is very, very intuitive. And this is what I'm very interested in. Benjamin's description also brings to mind a remembering which is part of the great myth of Osiris and Isis. It's an Egyptian creation myth. The myth of Osiris is the archetypal myth of transformation and becoming. It has been known in different oral traditions that during our lifetimes, uh, that which is important may be forgotten, but it never completely disappears. And this I've encountered over and over again. That which is important may be forgotten, but it never completely disappears. The mind may forget, but body memory is not to be taken lightly. In the Osiris and Isis myth, Osiris is regarded as the spirit of soil that animates and regenerates through creating an awareness of the body. It is through attuning to the body's rhythms that it is possible to create a space for remembering. And how do I talk about the body's rhythms? Through dream work, through body work that, you know, Dennis has also spoken about, and artwork. These are ways of moving from everyday rhythms of ordinary time into a deep time and an imaginal space that allows tuning into what might be called inner stories, which is a realm of forgetting. It allows one to be deeply in a moment rather than in the consciousness of being embodied. So we often talk about embodiment. And I'm I'm beginning to realize a lot of this work that happens around embodiment requires a certain kind of consciousness. I'm trying to move deeper beyond that into a moment where you're not even conscious of what you're conscious of. Um, the myth of Isis and Osiris always reminds me of an important aspect of tending to mythic journeys, to story journeys, 
and that is the necessity to submit. Osiris dies in the story and Isis kind of, it's one of the stories of the first embalming rituals. She puts the body together, she remembers the body in other words. So remember as in remembering, but remember also as in putting the different parts of his body together and making it whole again. Isis's journey of remembering plays out not only due to her determination to gather the parts, but equally her submission to what cannot be recovered, literally and metaphorically, from the river of time and being. Not all parts of her husband's body, of Osiris's body, are recoverable. His phallus is swallowed by the fish of the Nile. And Isis remembers Osiris by refashioning his phallus from wood or clay. There are different versions about this. They need to be then refashioned. So from remembering, then you're moving into refashioning. And here is the relationship between forgetting and remembering spelt out. There will be aspects that cannot be recovered with story or story journeys. Submitting to the forgetting and the refashioning is part of the life of the story. Now, refashioning can very easily fall into understanding refashioning as innovation. In, you know, I mean, our world is a very progress, unique, novel. What is it novel that you're bringing kind of obsessed world? As I worked as a rookie apprentice storyteller in my early storytelling life, I also kind of cogitated and puffed up my chest in anticipation of how wonderfully I could innovate, bring novel parts to a story. And I suffered cr cr crushing disappointments when I could not. Over time, working on my great aunt story and later the Osiris and Isis myth, another understanding of refashioning began to be refashioned. To me, refashioning is a work of maintenance. The maintenance of ritual, like Isis, and the maintenance of the story itself, like my great aunt story. For those of us who have worked with rituals, either grand rituals like marriage, death, making or making ceremonies or everyday rituals, um, I'm talking about all these rituals, from the grand rituals to everyday rituals like doing your yoga practice every morning, you will know that rituals are not about the exact replications of actions or processes. As is the way of time, things get lost, go missing, get broken. Maintenance, even in ritual, is about finding elements that will allow the larger sequence of events or the larger narrative to carry on. And this is what Isis is doing in refashioning the missing phallus, a creation that is a maintenance or it is in service of. And this is what happens each time I work with my great aunt story. So I'm nearly finishing. Um, working on a story is more often than not traveling with a story as it finds different forms, different layers, different facets to the characters in a story. With the story I mentioned in this essay, it was an experience of working with the story. As time, as the time I spent with the story grew, the number of times I told it, there were different facets that became more prominent. Some vanished. Through it, I began to learn about relationships within the sociocultural milieu of the place of the story and its ecology. So knowing that the story was from my father's ancestral region, which is called the Dakhan or Deccan, it allowed me not only to research the story, but to work with fragments of memory of the place that I had gathered through my father's and his siblings' stories and reminiscent memories. Since that family was no longer living, moments of doing nothing allowed fragmented memories to float up. Research follows that bubbling up. Initially, the research is for verification. Later on, to understand the place and a network of other stories from that place. The story then becomes a portal into meeting a place and people. It is then, as part of this research, that my conversations with family about family stories and memory begin. 
So in other words, I think what I'm trying to say in conclusion is that the telling of a story and getting familiar with potent moments in the story is a long journey into understanding the social, ecological, and cultural landscape of the story. It gives a sense of the width and breadth of the different characters that inhabit the story. So it's not just about creating the character of a particular type of woman or type of man or type of a bandit. That particular specific character arrives as I get to know the different kinds of men, women, farmers, bandits, marketplaces that crop up in the story. It's enough to know the ecology of the relationships between the characters so that a certain character of a woman or a man might arrive in a certain telling. It then is a delight to find what is recounted as a family story becomes a story of many, many people who live alongside um, bandits in these villages, live alongside specific farms in these villages. And each time you then tell the story, the story shifts slightly. And so all I'll say in the end is that the overlaps between the description, my description of a village that I had never visited, and my aunt's description of our ancestral village, that overlap is something I suppose in the end I can only kind of recount as a story. It continues to remain a mystery that reminds me that often a story doesn't have to be worked on but it's necessary to let it lie within oneself for it to begin to reveal itself. And therefore then, when I'm telling this story to different audiences, when I'm telling it in India, the form of the story will be different. When I'm telling it in Scotland, the form of the story will be different. When I'm telling it in um, Scandinavia, it arrives differently. And yet it is the same story. And I suppose that's what then resonates with the people because then it has a certain immediacy, but it also has a deep kind of, it has deep roots. And that's where I'll end. Thank you.